You and I have talked about how civilization rises up out of primitive society, what its distinguishing features are. Large populations concentrated initially around water sources, rivers, sedentary and intensive rather than transient and extensive like the steppe herders and Vikings. Uh, the people in civilizations have crossed the mimesis threshold. They're no longer held back from innovation by the dead ancestors. They invent writing in the form of glyphs or logosyllables, as in the case of cuneiform, which allows them to develop more advanced forms of mathematics and astronomy. They begin to worship sky gods in addition to the old earth goddesses or the other way around in Egypt's case. They have a priestly class that propitiates these gods. They build states that tax their subjects and conscript them into labor to build the monumental structures, to maintain order, to invade other peoples, and to prevent external invasion. This is civilization. Now, we've talked, and we'll talk more in the future, about how civilizations change over time. For example, over time, civilizations have mutated from mythical to mental layered on top of mythical to universal religion layered on top of mythical and mental. So for example, the Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations were just mythical. They had myths of sky and earth deities, and in Egypt's case, an elaborate central vision of the afterlife. Um, Hellenic civilization, a generation later, had the Homeric pantheon at the base with Zeus, the thunder hurler, holding pride of place, but the mental consciousness structure arose on top of it in the form of Platonic philosophy. Moving forward one further generation, Western civilization has Germanic and Celtic mythology at the base, but both Western philosophy and our universal religion of Christianity have been layered on top of it, a dual pseudomorphosis. And there are other key differences over time, too, having to do with ecology, per William Irwin Thompson, attitudes toward death, per Borkenau, uh, modes of worship, per Campbell, structures of consciousness, per Gebser. But as you have said, we're all in the shadow of Sumer. In other words, notwithstanding these changes in the nature of civilization over time, in an important sense, we haven't really advanced past the Sumerian model. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is what do you mean by that? Well, the Sumerian model, I mean, with ancient Sumer, 3500 BC, they've been, of course, when you study the archeological backdrop that leads up to Sumer, it didn't, it seems like it happened all at once, suddenly overnight. It was a creative explosion, that's for sure. But you can see the, the cultural strata building up through the Neolithic first, you know, 10,000 BC with, with settlements, uh, concrete villages, houses as domestic dwelling places. And the key to all of this is, of course, agriculture, because so you don't have to follow animals around anymore uh, in their migrations. You can stay rooted in one spot if you have a constant food supply. So that allows, that opens up a clearing, a space in which these villages emerge almost themselves already like plants. Note that when Spengler compares the high civilizations to plants, there actually is an archaeological reason for that going back to the first villages because they grow up like plants because they're living in what Campbell calls the way of the seeded earth and they're imitating plants. Villages grow up. Eventually, they become ghost towns, all of them, every single one of them. So the villages too have life cycles. It'd be interesting if some Spangler guy would come along and tell us what the life cycle of a village is, because clearly they do have them because they're all abandoned eventually. And um, so, and then as you go through the Neolithic from the uh, pre-pottery Neolithic A, 10,000 to 8,000, uh, where the architecture has a morphology, it's circular um, in almost every case, um, at the two, the pre-pottery Neolithic B, which is roughly 8,000 to 6,000. Uh, then we get rectangular architecture. They start thinking in terms of right angles. And eventually, long about 7,000, they start thinking about streets, how they can separate houses uh, and create streets as thoroughfares for pedestrians going through them at places like Baucris and El Kaum. Uh, they're thinking about streets, 7,000 BC. And by the time we get to 6,500 BC, we're in the pottery Neolithic now. Pottery comes in in a big way with the invention of the double kiln, the two-chambered kiln that enables firing at much higher temperatures than hitherto. And so you get a very refined pottery com coming in. And it's the type of pottery, I've never done this, but you can click it and it clinks. Uh, it's so well made. And they have uh, incredible iconographies in, in, on the inside of them 
which I'm convinced are astronomical, uh, but that's a theory. Uh, and then you get two, two different cultures, the Halafians in, in, uh, in the forested north, uh, the Taurus Mountains region, lots of rain going on there. And then down on the alluvial plain where there's not much rain um, and they have to invent irrigation, which some scholars suspect was invented at Al-Kaum, which is off the Euphrates. And um, that's at that place that we first find canals and ditches being dug for irrigation. Uh, and then these two cultures, the Samarans, so you have Samaran pottery named after the site of Samara um, in opposition to Halafian uh, pottery in the north, but the Halafians are conservators because they're not forced into a challenge and response situation the way that the Samarans are 6,000 BC, let's say to about 5,000 because they have to respond to the challenge of desertification. There's not enough rain here. So what are we gonna do? So they've already invented irrigation a ways back. So then they invent canal building on a massive scale at a site called Chogamami uh, along about 4,000. And so it's not an accident that from five to 4,000, then to 3,500 BC, civilization comes up and running because they're down on the Tigris, on the alluvial plain between the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, and they've mastered, they've, they control these rivers, they've mastered it. So it's, uh, it's a hydraulic economy. Um, they've got lots of grain, and then pretty soon all these temples um, that are in one sort of place, that, which had been villages, now begin to interlock, and pretty soon they invent membranes around themselves as city walls, because they know they'll be attacked by another city. So now we start getting, it's almost like a recapitulation of evolution, where we get the first bacteria coming into being in the ocean uh, that develop lipid membranes uh, to protect their uh, DNA or RNA, as the case may be. Um, that's what, and the nucleus here then corresponds to the temples, what later become ziggurats, the temples, which is the nucleus, that is the center that must be protected at all costs, because it is the place where the gods will land when they give prayers to the gods, and they've done work for them, and everyone is doing their share through corvée work, people participate in digging the canals, planting the fields, uh, there's taxation that then comes in, um, they invent writing specifically to keep track of the, of the taxes, uh, namely donations to the temples that are brought in. So we keep track of that. We need a way to keep track of it. So writing comes in uh, as a necessity for that reason. Not really a religious reason, except for the fact that it's priests who are pretty much inventing it at places like Uruk, 3500 BC. So we have writing, we have astronomy, we have uh, complex temple building, we have people situated in place. We have the distinction between the, the people who are in the cities, city folk, versus the rubes and farmers out there that are looked down on. So when the first great epic comes along with the Babylonian Gilgamesh epic, that's what those two are. Gilgamesh is the city dweller, the king, and Enkidu is the rube who has come in from the provinces, from the outer lands, uh, and the two of them become buddies because that's the core opposition here that the calling forth of the city brings into being, that, that pair. Um, so that's the birth of civilization as a concept, as an idea, and the Sumerians are first off the mark, definitely, 3,500. I've even seen dates now pushing that back to 4,000. Um, and then Egypt, 1,000. If it is 4,000, then Egypt is until 3,000. So they're second off the mark. And they basically copy the same culture forms as the Sumerians. They've got the centralized priesthood, uh, the great monuments, in this case, the pyramids. They have writing, and in their case, writing originating in connection with tomb cult inscriptions, not taxes. Um, and so forth. So it all comes into being, but it's all a transformation, more or less, of basic prototypes and precedents set up by the Sumerians. And civilization, the concept of it really hasn't changed since in terms of the idea of what constitutes a civilized person. You live in cities. We have cities now. But we are on the threshold now, perhaps of the biggest change since then, where we have a global civilization now. Um, the city has been exported around the globe. Uh, the distinction between city folk and rubes is becoming sort of thinner and thinner now with the exportation of the city through cell phones and internet. Uh, it sort of exports the city so that, you know, when you have a cell phone, you have city wherever you go. You have access to it no matter what you do, where you're at due to the satellites in the exosphere surrounding this place. So the whole planet is city now. This is a new potential, potentially anyway, phase in the history, in human history, of moving on into something brand new that might be equivalent in its importance to 
the Sumerian invention of civilization circa 3500 BC. I can't remember the name of the authors, but I know that a couple of authors have argued that there's some level above civilization that has already been attained, having to do with interconnected civilizations. But I don't know much about this literature, and you're clearly gesturing towards something similar. And maybe scholars disagree about whether we have already reach some level above civilization that is something more global in scope or something that's just very different in character. But your argument would be that basically even up until the present, mm -hmm. we're still in the shadow of Sumer, but we're breaking out right around now. Is that what you would argue? Something like that, but we're on the cusp. And yeah. um, the cusp is, you know, it's not something that happens in, in a generation. It takes a while, a few centuries at least, uh, as a transition to something new. Um, will it be the case that we'll have one currency, like a digital currency, like a cryptocurrency that's planetary in scale? Will we have one religion that's planetary in scale? You know, it might start thinking in terms of that, that these societies, they might slowly let go of their parochialism and their uh, sort of provincial place boundedness, because after all, all the civilizations, especially like China, India, Iran, the Middle East are kind of thermodynamically exhausted. They've, they've really reached equilibrium. They've been there, done that. They're at the tail end. So what's new for them? The West is finishing out its final centuries. Uh, and Russia, who knows? Uh, Spangler thought Russia would be the wave of the future, but, but we don't know yet at this point, maybe. Um, so the question then becomes is, you know, and with all the travel, the, the air flights going all over the place and lots of intermarriages going all over the place. More and more people are having mixed marriages. Uh, more and more, everything is going over time. It'll, it'll take a while. It's not going to happen 10 years from now or even a century from now. It'll take a while. But all this global intermixing of genes, global, global intermixing of the economy, of the signifiers from all the various religions, Sooner or later, all of that's going to coalesce and cohere into a single new, let's say, old age of man. Uh, we've already had the childhood with the tribal period and the mature period with the, the uh, emergence and sumer of the city state and civilization itself. Maybe this is, we're on the cusp then of a transformation into the wise old age of humanity, where we have a whole new conception of the unification of all the societies on the planet. If we develop in the coming centuries or millennia, a kind of global society or civilization, it might be very analogous to the more parochial civilizations that have existed for the last 5,000 years, right? There might still be a unifying religion. There probably will be a core and a hinterland. A lot of the same class differences, urban rural differences, maybe the main difference is just the Sumerian model is the model of parochial civilization, a civilization, as you say, that's bounded in a particular place, has a particular religion that's different from religions elsewhere in the world. And in that sense, we are in the shadow of Sumer because Western civilization too, it has a particular semiotics, you know, just like Magian civilization, just like all the other civilizations. And we're talking about only having one, right? But it might be very analogous, like the global civilization might be very analogous to all of the parochial civilizations, just global rather than parochial. But I don't know, maybe there would be pretty significant disanalogies. One challenge for a global civilization is not having an opposing civilization to define yourself against. Um, and that's a significant social and psychological challenge, I think, because group identity and cohesion may depend on opposition to something that exists, that is real. And in the absence of alien life forms becoming a menace, it may be hard for a single civilization to cohere globally. I'm sure that the various warring Arabic tribes before Mohammed came in and unified them with a single monotheistic idea probably thought the same thing. There's no way our tribes are ever going to get along. They're all too bound and set in their ways. And there were a lot of tribes covering the entire uh, peninsula, the, the entire Sinai Peninsula there, um, the Syro Arabian Desert. And uh, this guy comes along with one idea and says, let's all get along as Arabs, thus defining an interior to a society, namely Islamic civilization. But it, in a certain sense, the, 
the, the tribal warfare then gets projected onto the others. So the others, there's a redefinition of otherness now that's not us, Arabic tribes, but the Jews, uh, Middle Easterners, the Persians, the North Africans, the people living in Europe, um, that has to be made war on jihad uh, so that we can keep expanding this interior that is us um, against the warring exteriors, not in this case necessarily of external proletariats, but external civilizations that have a different identity. Um, so there is that. So this is an interesting question, though, about with regard to globalization, if it's the entire planet and there's no longer external right. proletariats, we still do have the issue then of internal proletariats, of which I'm sure there, there will be many because uh, there always are. And these are defined by Toynbee as those a, a, a disaffected group who is within a culture or society, but not out of it, because they have lost faith in the dominant minorities. Uh, they're no longer a creative minority that can inspire by mimesis, but so they rule by force now, the dominant minority. So the internal proletariat always wants to secede from the body social. With their, they've got their own DNA. Um, they're like a cancerous tumor. They, they, they've got, they're running on their own program now. And they can expand as Christianity did and eventually engulf the mother body or the hosts, the host society. Uh, and take it over. So there is that issue with respect to a global society. It occurs to me, I, don't, I wouldn't want to overstate this analogy, but certainly in the Western world, and even to some extent beyond it, you are seeing a lot of citizens in various countries on both sides of the Atlantic, and even in parts of the developing world, rebelling, at least electorally, against the, the globalist elite, right? We're kind of right. seeing the proto internal proletariat of a globalized world in the form of the Trump electorate or the Brexit electorate or the base of this new French candidate, Eric Zamora, I think is his name. Um, uh, by Toynbee's definition, within this new, let's say, old age of humanity, uh, pocket internal proletariats erupting, let's say uh, ISIS-K uh, might be an example of an internal proletariat within the otherwise functional Islamic society same thing with Al Qaeda. These are really internal proletariats within Islam, because otherwise Islam functions just fine with normal people doing normal things, living normal lives, not trying to chop people's heads off uh, and convert them to whatever insane interpretation of Sharia law that they want to do. So they themselves are an internal proletariat within Islamic society. Um, it's not Islam that's the problem. It's these radical elements that that are. Uh, and here's Toynbee's term, they're fossils. These are these kinds of internal proletariats are fossils left over from a previous age. As Al-Qaeda is, it's, they're still gone. And as the Taliban is, they want to go back to the old days of the caliphate uh, and reinstall something left over from that third generation of civilization, which brought Islam, Islam into being as a religion of credo, not ethnicity, uh, a, a religion of credo. Um, but it's bound to that universal church phase of Toynbee's model of the third generation that this fourth phase then, if he was alive today, he might add a fourth phase of this globalized world without an external pro proletariat, but with plenty of internal disaffected proletariats um, who would then be left, they would be fossils, atavisms left over, uh, little pockets uh, wanting to bring back the previous mentality. So- One other thing that adds credibility to the notion that we could be entering a global civil society is that increasingly we're living in the metaverse, which bears no relation to physical or geographical reality, right? So increasingly it doesn't matter where you are geographically. You know, Spingler, and I think anyone would acknowledge that the nature of a culture depends very heavily on the nature of the landscape out of which it springs. But if we're living in the metaverse, which can be sort of homogenized, globally right um yeah it's sort of like uh the modern version of one of campbell's mythogenetic zones would be the planet itself in its entirety for this right. globalized vision of a civilization that is the new mythogenetic zone it's not you know between the tigris and euphrates or on the other side of the zagros mountains or on the western side of the himalayas these are old mythogenetic zones that were local provincial parochial whatever you want to say but now the whole, 
the whole planet then becomes a mythogenetic zone for a brand new uh, phase of civilization hitherto unprecedented and never seen before. Um, right. The other possibility wonder, though, is that the whole I, thing I wonder, might oh. break down. I know <laughs> yeah, you yeah, share a different um, view on uh, climate change and so forth, uh, but there is that to contend with. If it does happen to be the case that it's correct, um, it, could, it could very well change and will, will change because it'll change the whole structure of the climate, sea level rise and so forth, uh, the wiping out of coastal cities. Uh, it could be analogous to the epoch that ended the ice age where they have all this ice, it melts, the sea levels rise, the caves are gone. A lot of them went underwater too, by the way, like Coquer, that's a, that's a cave in France that went underwater. Um, and that ended that whole epoch, that uh, sea level rise. And then now they've got these rivers. And so now we get Thompson's riverine ecologies that start coming into being all over the place, China, India, Middle East, uh, not so much in Greece, of course, but um, so it might be something analogous to that, that puts an end to Toynbee's third generation, the way that sea level rise put it into the Paleolithic society, um, thus clearing the stage and announcing a new, a new landscape, still global in extent, uh, that has withdrawn from, from the coastal territories more inland and more up away from the, the desertifying belt around uh, the globe that is going to spread. And um, so that we may be in transition toward this and the technologies might be retained. Um, the, the electronic technologies in communication with the satellites that delocalize and don't make us so dependent on a local power grid. Um, if they can be portable, the, the power grids that keep the internet running and keep the whole society plugged in and able to communicate with each other, then yeah, the, the electronic basis, the electronic on the techno, what Toynbee calls the technological plane, because he sees a political plane, a technological plane, an economic plane, and a cultural plane, and they're all different. Um, but on the technological plane, it could form the basis after this in, interregnum with global warming for this global society that then is, because everyone's going to be forced to cooperate, they'll have to be. Um, so long as that technology remains up and running and functional. And that's one thing I'm not 100% sure about because um, just like in the movie Blade Runner 2049, you know, where, where they're dealing with a blackout that they've had where the whole power grid was shut out and there's all this information loss. So they've had a, like a miniature dark age there. Uh, that may be a, a very prescient thing. Um, mm -hmm. So one reason why serious global unity is going to take a long time to come to pass is that a precondition for the creation of a global civilization is a global culture around which all peoples of the world can unite. And just given the state of the world today, it's obviously not going to happen really quickly, but it could happen. Um, no. Yeah. Because you get all these local pullbacks, you know, Islam right. wanted to turn back the clock, um, you know, local pullbacks against the new, uh, the boundary eroding uh, global civilization that's a threat. Uh, and rightly so, uh, that's a threat to all the individual civilizations left over from the second and third generations. It's a standard process, though. In order to make something new, like an alchemy, if you want to get gold, you have to first put the metals inside of a pot, an alembic, whatever, and apply heat to them and melt them down and then combine them. Then you start extracting solids so that you can eventually produce the gold. So this meltdown process was known as the negrito, the blackening, uh, which is absolutely fundamental. That's step one to getting to the gold. Then the second phase then is then the albedo, the, the purification of the metals and substances, the whitening of them. Uh, and then finally the rubido, the reddening, which uh, applies calcification again in fire in order to produce the gold, not actual gold, of course, but the philosopher's stone, uh, philosophically that can enable you to attain the, the, the epiphany, the, the, which in this case would be the new global higher religion that unites all of these warring tribes, uh, just like Muhammad did with, on a miniature scale with, with his single monotheistic religion that in his case, by the way, was inspired from the Jews because there mm -hmm. were lots of Jewish tribes there intermixed at Mecca and Medina as well. And the monotheistic influence comes directly from Judaism uh, to Islam. Uh, and then that provides them with a catalyst, a, a transformational dynamo in their the Arabic collective imagination that sends them in all directions. 
you know, across North Africa into Spain, uh, conquering the Sassanids in the east and uh, the, what had been the domain of the Persian Achaemenid Empire, unifying it all together with the Umayyad Caliphate and the Abbasid Caliphate. Um, they do sort of create a universal state out of all that based on one idea, the idea of unity that is sanctified by the fact that it's rooted in one God, Allah, who previously had been part of a polytheistic pantheon at Mecca amongst the Arabs. There was, uh, at one point in the Kaaba, there were 360 statues corresponding, I suppose, to the days of the, the year uh, with all these differing, uh, differing tribes favoring one or the other of those gods. Allah was merely one of those. Uh, and Allah, uh, Muhammad rather favored him and said, let's just take this one guy and we'll all worship this, get rid of the others, especially the goddesses, um, get rid of all of them. And that's pretty much what happened. Spengler characterizes it as a kind of uh, Puritanism, uh, a, a radical kind of way of eliminating everyone else, but one set of ideas, kind of with like with Cromwell in the 17th century, okay. with Pythagoras for, uh, for the Greeks, going back to a, an original purified idea that we then all follow zealously. Um, so you never know, some yeah. guy like that might turn up on the global stage. <laughs> right, uh, right. It's, it's kind of scary, but... About 10 years ago, I heard Jonathan Haidt state categorically that human beings cannot cohere with each other in the absence of a com common enemy. And so yeah, right. I continue to wonder if that's prohibitive for the creation of a global civilization. But I almost, I just want to leave that hanging and maybe we can return to it. 